Greetings to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. I am honored and blessed to be here with my friend, ally, and artist, I would say extraordinaire. You'll learn quickly what I mean by that, by Mr. Tom Sewell here at I Wish You Could See the Artistry in the Elegance of the Sewell Studio, 17 acres of organic manicured beauty here in Haiku, Maui, Hawaii. And we're going to dive into that. Welcome to my podcast, As I See It. This is the special guest series. Um, and uh, please tell your friends, tune in, enjoy this journey of my particular style, which is spontaneity. And trusting more in the natural, organic flow of just being humans together rather than something scripted. And uh, from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. And I thank you, Tom, for taking the time from your art, your life, your family, your life, to gift all of us, uh, I would say, a rare chance to explore the mind and the heart and the life of a life artist, I might add, a life artist. Um, and then within that, the disciplines of a photographer, a videographer, uh, a sculptor that rare do you see in the world. I was blessed just the other night to attend a beautiful concert of cellists and penis at the Sugar Mill, which we'll get into, which is a 17,000 square foot restored post Sugar Mill here in Hawaii that in itself is a piece of art, and within it are these magnificent, unique sculptures made from the parts of a sugar mill that were abandoned and going to be just put into the sediment belt of fossil fuels until Tom, again, had the epiphany to restore, regenerate, and bring to life uh, these magnificent pieces of art. So enough of me as an introduction, and may I just kindly introduce you to Mr. Sewell, Tom Sewell. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Alan. I love talking to you. Well, the <coughs> honor is mine, Tom. I'm blessed to be here as a temporary guest <coughs> on his beloved property. And so just a few things about Tom's background, and then more specifically some of the questions that maybe you're thinking that I'll bring to Tom and we can explore them. Uh, born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, brought up in the desire to create influences by different people and artists. Uh, if I'm correct, started the Bodega Gallery, is it? Bodega. Mm -hmm. Bodega Gallery and an international gallery in Minneapolis. Now, this is pretty cutting edge at the time <clears throat> and continues to be avant-garde in every sense of the word. His earliest influences, uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, who brings to mind cubism and Dada and conceptual art. Uh, if I'm correct, he ushered in, in many ways, a lot of the edgy 21st century art from retinal art, eye-driven art, you know, the, the, let's look at it through the eye, into mind art. And Tom is in that school of, of like, he took it from mind to lifestyle art, within it certain disciplines as well. Photography, sculpture, uh, videography, uh, and really explored the experimental nature of what it means to be, I guess, defining your life by art. Went to Brazil early on. He's a long-time yogi who practiced with uh, Patabi Joy in India for nearly a year, correct? And uh, a remarkable, I would say, humble example of not forcing one's image to be defined by spirituality, like a lot of people, but really breathes it and lives it through diet and health, 
through attitude, through philosophy. I've been blessed to have numerous dinners and casual encounters, and you can just see I'm a real sensitive creature to do people manifest their integrity. Tom is in that rare category of not only manifesting it, but making art of it. Rooted in dignity and in respect, a remarkably respectful being. And traveling the world from Brazil to India, eventually being led to a place in the world that I'm familiar with, Venice Beach, California, Southern California, where uh, and I recommend, by the way, before I get into Tom, there's just so much to say and there's so little time to say it, TomSewell.com, check it out. Look at his work, his art, his studios, his numerous books uh, and installations and exhibitions. But came to Maui in something like 1990, perhaps, mm -hmm. and was influenced by a lot of different people. One gentleman, Basil Langston, early on in his life. I've mentioned Andre Gregory, who introduced him, if I'm correct, to the U.S. Poet Laureate, not once, but twice. And I think only has one other poet, Jack Frost, I think I'm correct to say, has ever won the U.S. Poet Laureate Award twice. Tom's major mentor and dear friend, uh, William S. Merlin. Uh, and so there's philosophy, there's art, there's poetry, and Tom is married for some years, nearly two decades plus, to Michelle a remarkable woman in her own right, and together they bring something even more remarkable. Uh, and there's just so much to say, but let me stop here, and I promise to open it up to Tom. Where could we begin in a way that feels true and organic to you? Where would you invite someone who's virtually unknown to your art and heart? First of all, may I say uh, I'm honored deeply by your introduction. Uh, you can go on forever if you like. <laughs> you're, you're great. Uh, I'd like to know this guy you're talking about. Well, um, <clears throat> take your time. I think my, uh, something that's very important to me is serendipity. I like the art of chance, stumbling over wondrous things by accident. Uh, Man Ray said he likes to make art with a minimum of effort, and um, Duchamp liked to find uh, ready-made objects and acknowledge them as art. And um, those two influences, as a young man, in, uh, had a big, strong impact on me. Um, I had a lot of trouble as a, as a teenager. I was not the best son for my mother and father. I was getting into trouble and crying and one thing or another, and I was unfocused and probably ADD, and I, I don't know what was going on, but I found a lot of joy in stealing tires and, and, and lighting fires and breaking windows. And then I, I think the first opening for me was in Venice, well, my opening my art gallery, not knowing anything about art really, mm -hmm. and having the gallery in 1963 at age 23, that was so exciting mm -hmm. and um, magical. At that period, in Minneapolis on Hennepin Avenue, there weren't any other commercial galleries. There was one or two in a hair salon or framing shop, but mine was the only real gallery. And people would come up and um, I just, it was, I was on fire mm -hmm. as a young man. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a turning point. 23 years old, having my gallery and meeting people like Rauschenberg and Hockney and having Marcel Duchamp come up and spend a day and half a night with me. Those things were magical. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't even plan them. I didn't know at the time. I just thought it felt like fun. 
But to have the, that influence, especially Duchamp, putting his hand on my shoulder and saying that, that my erotic collages were the freshest things he'd seen in oh, years. Wow, I mean, I've lived on that for 60 years. <clears throat> That's when I started changing. <clears throat> Duchamp, Basil Langton walked up the steps to my gallery and we became friends. And I carried on a 35 year correspondence with him. Wow. Made a big thick book on it. So I was off and running and um, I did that for three years. Uh, one day I lost my lease, I had to move out, and everybody said, oh, it's the end of the world, it's, you know, and I, of course, think that everything is a plus, that everything is an opportunity, and I, you know, I just said goodbye to Minneapolis, <clears throat> and I fell in love. Greetings to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today, I am honored and delighted to be here with my friend, Tom Sewell, at his, I want to use the word extraordinary, but it's even beyond that, Sewell Studio here in Haiku, Maui, Hawaii. And we're in my special guest series uh, that I do once every few months. And today is primarily an interview conversation with Tom, who I've known for a couple of decades. And rare do I feel truly heartfelt in my inspiration in areas that I most respect, my integrity, my dignity, my conscience, my artistry, and mixing those things together. Tom is mentor, friend, and international expression of life as art, lifestyle as art. Rare, 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 rare to see that in the world. And it's not 10 years or 20 years, multiple decades of an evolving personal attribute that I see in him. It's a continual challenge. And those of you who are artists, yogis, whatever you are, the challenge to recreate yourself on the terms of your person. That person is not just your choice, but Tom infuses decades of life as a yogi one of the first being in India with Patabi Joy, made a lifestyle out of diet, health, consciousness, joy, yoga, meditation, and a multidisciplined artist. Please settle in, take your time. This is not something to get through. You don't communicate decades of courage and artistry and moral discipline and I would use the word very avant-garde art. Duchamp, Andre Gregory, the two-time U.S. Poet Laureate, William S. Merwin, major mentor, close friend, Rubach, who you'll hear about over the course of this conversation, Rare in this world, those of you who know, to have mentors that you stay with, that are willing to stay with you for a year, a decade, two, three, four, way back. And so Tom is an organic expression of the humility, in my words, the humility and the artistry of being accepted by remarkable minds. It's one thing to meet people spontaneously at parties or soirees or dinners or red carpet, whatever. But it's a whole other game to be respected by them enough to be in their company and mentored by them. Tom is an expression of the school of the Renaissance. Duchamp, many of you who know, who've studied art, ushered in 21st century conceptual art. He took it off the eye, retinal art. He brought in conceptual art. Things come to mind like cubism, Dada. These are radical genres that, you know, are easily forgotten. Tom brought historic, edgy art, and I might add, he is not just still going, but demanding in himself. And those of you who know, by the way, I'm not just like lavishing on compliments. These are understatements. I rarely say these things about anyone. 
These are understatements about my humble relationship with this gentleman. I can't encourage you enough. Uh, enjoy his creations, his mind, his philosophy, his family, his allies, his muses. The man is down with muses, erotic muses, philosophical muses, gardeners, poets, philosophers, artists, filmmakers, videographers. If you could just see the studio, and perhaps we'll do some filming in his studio, 17 acres of studio art, several thousand square feet here in this studio that I might add by his very beloved friend, Dennis Gasner, many of you know, the award-winning, Oscar-winning production designer of films like The Truman Show, which this is made from. Many of the set designs that were from that particular show that Dennis was the production designer of. I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1917. Imagine making the design for that. Blade Runner. Blade Runner. We all love Blade Runner. 19, 2049. So many others. The Bond movies, for God's sake. Tom has a multiplicity of compelling relationships in his life. And the sugar mill. I was blessed just to go the other night. And I'll end with this short introduction and let Tom take over and we'll speak. 17,000 square feet. Who could use those words together anymore? <laughs> and it's filled with art, sculpture, magnificent sculpture that's for sale, by the way. TomSewell.com, check it out. He's restored and reinvented the working parts of a sugar mill that's now not abandoned. It's like sugar is sort of, you know, passe. We're well on beyond that now. We understand something more. Tom took this abandoned mill and recreated something that's iconic with its parts. Sculpture. And within it, two cellists, world-class cellists and a pianist, a magnificent night of music, but at the same time, again, in this gentleman's style, which I'm really down with, and I've said it to him many times, but not enough, it's not just the exhibition or the art on the wall or the sculpture in the room or on the land. The dinner, the soiree, the event, the clothing, the food, the ambiance is a conscious decision for juxtaposition, nuance, the serendipity of magic and miracle. Where do you see that? Where do you have a chance to experience the oxygen of that level of lifestyle art? So may I just stop for a moment and take a moment to introduce Mr. Tom Sewell here at his home in Haiku, where I'm blessed to be staying temporarily. And uh, may we dive a little bit into some of your uh, mentors uh, Duchamp, uh, the gentleman Basil Lingston. Um, Mentor, uh, mentors and muses. Muses is another thing I want Tom to talk about. Mentors and muses, partners and interns. Four things that are very important to me. One more time. Mentors, muses, partners, and interns. Make those notes for all of us in terms of a life of art. Uh, William S. Merwin, again, two-time U.S. Nobel, not Nobel, yeah, Nobel Poet Laureate in America, rare, except for, I think it was Jack Frost that won it for two occasions. And these are very dramatic influences in our lives. It's not easy to be a student, even for a month, we know that. But to be anointed, and I've said this numerous times, and perhaps even again, just to be in the company of a mentor is not an easy task, to be allowed the sanctity to learn like that. That's it. It's a very rare gift to be humble enough and curious enough to be taken in to learn like that. Tom is in that school and I would like to have him speak on some of the attributes on what it means to be both a mentor, he's a mentor to many people, and also what does it mean to be mentored? What are some of the 
things that we could all learn from that, as well as art. And so I take a moment to pause. Thank you for taking time in your life. Where can we dive into this, Tom? Where would be good for you and for those of us out there learning about how to make life our art? Well, for, first of all, thank you. Your words are beautiful. Your passion is immense. And you're so articulate. I love listening to you talk. I love interacting with you. Beautiful. And I love you as a friend. Thank you. It's very sweet that you've taken the time to do this it's with my me. my honor. Thank you very much. So the important things to me, as I said, partners, interns, mentors, and muses. P-I-M-M. -M. I mean, th these things I live by. And I also like to say yes. <clears throat> we record it. We're good. I like to say yes. And I like to be positive. I like to think that <clears throat> when the phone rings, it's good news. When the mailman comes, it's something good. Uh, when a person walks down my driveway with a little cardboard suitcase coming from Austria, I welcome him. And he turns out to be a, a new dear friend. And through him, I have magic happen. I like to welcome people into my life and say yes. Mm. And it's a joy to, to be in that realm. Uh, it was difficult for the last two years in the sense that I able, wasn't able to communicate that much with people and the mask and so forth. Oh, it was yeah, a yeah, difficult yeah. time. So I went inward, I read a lot, I did a lot of very unusual, different art. But now that that's kind of beyond us, uh, I'm back. And the other night was a good example of uh, having uh, 50 people in, in my studio here in Haiku. And the next night, 50 more people in my studio at the Sugar Mill. And it was a wonderful, joyful experience. And magic started to happen immediately. Um, collectors came up to me and different people wanted to participate in my my art world and my art life. And that was very rewarding. So um, aside from having those four things important, let me just go through them. Partners, Dennis Gasner being a partner here in this studio uh, in Haiku, um, 40 year friend and dear, dear friend. Uh, partners in this studio, uh, being a, a recreation of a set from The Truman Show. Um, another partner is my wife, a full-on partner, and really important to me. I have a partner, two partners in Los Angeles, uh, Roger Webster, who's called Mona now, and uh, my friend uh, Boyd Willett. Um, I had a partner in Brazil on a piece of land that I just sold that I owned for 60 years, uh, and the dear partner, Laz Franco. So partner is important, important, very important to me. I can't do anything alone. Mm. Um, interns uh, are a great joy to me. I have a marvelous connection with the University of Cincinnati and the uh, Art Center in Los Angeles. Art Center, thanks to Dennis Gassner. And also, Interns come from Germany, from South America, a lot of word of mouth. Uh, I love working with the younger people, uh, four to six months at a time, working on projects, my projects, their projects. And it's a tremendous source of energy for me and fun. I see these young people coming, like especially from Cincinnati, they'll come. Uh, a lot of them don't get out into nature. They, uh, mm. they don't eat very well. They're looking at their computers and their phones all day. And they come here mm -hmm. ostensibly to learn about photography, architecture, uh, sculpture, uh, the environment. But really what happens is it's a lifestyle change for them. Mm -hmm. And they learn about life. We'll have dinner parties in my house. Mm -hmm. We'll meet interesting guests that come from around the world, a cellist from uh, Tokyo, an architect from Austria, um, various people will come and have dinners together so that interns can learn how to how to relate on a world mm, level. Beautiful. Uh, they can listen to poetry with me. We have a lot of poetry readings and we always listen 
and read W.S. Merwin's poetry and uh, listen to Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac in the morning and hear a poem every day. And now we're reading uh, Edward Hirsch and uh, his uh, teaching us how to read poetry, how to really absorb it. And at night we'll discuss those things. We'll listen to music. We'll see films uh, every night for, every Monday night for 11 years. Mm. We had a film club here in the studio oh, wow. where we would project a film and then discuss it. Many of them foreign films, most of them. Uh, <clears throat> wonderful discussions late into the night about cinematography, about scripts, about acting, about directing, about lighting, about the backstories of the films. Uh, we take the, I take the interns swimming in the morning. Uh, we'll take them to Snork and Fork Club Sundays to our right. swim club. Um, They'll see how we prepare organic food and eat. It totally changes their lives. Okay, so totally. You're a, a full spectrum healer artist. Well, it, it just happened. It was really magnificent the way it all unfolded. And we get letters from them. Um, they tell us that uh, their lives have changed. They're looking at things differently. Uh, one young man said, I'm even thinking about eating more vegetables. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah. Partners, interns, muses. I couldn't do anything without muses, and and I've had so many, and I do have many. May I delight in? I am fascinated by the word muse as well, the compelling nature of that. Would you just share in your own humble improvisational way what is? How can we understand how Tom Sewell understands the muse? Well, uh, I think that. Uh, Years ago, um, William Merwin had a, a mentor who said to him, uh, worship the muse, get down on your knees and worship the muse every day. And he said, and I mean that literally. Oh my goodness. And um, <clears throat> I, I think that having a muse, they come in all different varieties. Um, <clears throat> it's a magical experience, it's hard to describe, but when you feel a certain <clears throat> creativity, when you're with a muse, and it's fun, and it um, enlarges your, your life, your spiritual life, your artistic life, your, the way you breathe, uh, there's something magic to it. <clears throat> and I can't really quite put my finger on what it is. So it's a kind of chemical, alchemical excitement based upon something outside, brought inside? Something that happens, a, a fusion, a, a chemical Brings reaction. Brings out something bigger in Some, yourself. Something bigger in yourself. So I have lots of muses, and my wife, bless her heart, is both a muse and a partner and encourages my muses. Oh, wow, that's no spectacular. Sense Let's make a note of that level of openness and creative <laughs> support. Muse partnering and encourages the muse. No boundaries, or there's a few boundaries. There's there. boundaries, but yeah. lots of boundaries. But uh, but that it's it's great to have a wife like that who sees the benefit of a muse. And what what is the what's the what what is a muse that say a partner may not provide? It's very rare to put a partner and a muse together. A lot of people fall in love, but they're not fall in muse. Well, I'll give you an they example. Often fall in complexity. I'll give you an example <clears throat> of a great muse. Uh, one is Olivia Coletti, who works with me and uh, collaborates with me, manages my studio, and each day o Olivia comes to work in a different outfit, and I photograph her. And it's always great fun to see what she's wearing, to see what she has to say. I'll take her to the uh, abandoned sugar mill and um, <clears throat> we'll photograph her in the wild. Um, we'll collaborate on, on photos, projects, music. Um, here she is at the abandoned sh sugar mill in Paia with my wife. Um, so a muse is essentially 
an inspiration of the heart and soul to bring forth creations in your genre of art and life that exceed your individual ability to do it on your own? I don't do anything on my own, Alan. Okay, I you're a relational artist. I can't do anything on my own. It's a partner, muse. I've got to have it all. I've got to have all those elements. Beautiful. And um, Olivia, for example, supplies a lot of that. My wife supplies a lot of that. I just feel that uh, I'm better with, some, with, with those four elements than I am alone. Um, and it seems to work. I have so even extreme ex success. I have a tremendous success, almost by accident, by chance, serendipity. Mm -hmm. um, I love saying yes, and I love working with those four elements. And uh, I just wait for magic to happen. You know, may I ask you if you would? Everyone who's in, in the art world wants to know more of how to manifest their work. There's just a general sense that the more you empower artistry, the less you'll have of everything good in the world, except the integrity of creating a poor lifestyle with great art that no one sees and you get vilified because you're true to yourself. But this gentleman has brought in scores of people, interesting, compelling people, and manifested a big multi-genre expression of artistry, including lifestyle. What are some of the key points that you could bring forth for others who are emerging? What do they need to do, think about in their lives to give the courage and the power to live more consciously in their artistry? rather than capitulating to capitalism and the economy and livelihood and the struggle to financially survive. How did the... Well, I have to say, you know Evan, I mean. in growing up in California in the 70s, um, I was directed quite often somewhat magically to different things. Mm. Um, my mentor, Basil Langton, said to go to Esalen Institute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So retreats at Esalen became very powerful for me. Another friend, George Van Hoy, said, my friend Sherry and I just did something called the S training, Werner Earhart's training, uh, Earhart seminar training. That had a big impact on it's a week. It's a weekend situation, practically all nights. and. Um, had a huge impact on me. Uh, I just said yes to it. And it was difficult at first, but you've got two or 300 people sharing from their heart, standing up and sharing and maybe crying and maybe being uh, reduced to nothing in a way, and then building themselves back up in you right in front of your eyes. Could you say what you most remember learning from that? Well, if, when I left the, the training, the first thing I thought to myself was, I have a son named Fred that I really don't know who he is. I'd created a son when I was 17, married his wife, uh, married his, his mom, who became my wife for one year. We divorced, she remarried, they moved to Canada. And I didn't know this son mm. for 17 years. Mm. So I thought to myself after the training, uh, I have a son I want to know. So I started writing to him. And we became friends, and now we're dear friends. We hold each other in our oh, arms. Wow, I hug him. We cry together. We listen to music. We talk about deep, important things. And uh, we call each other whenever we want to speak. It, it, that came out of it. Uh, the other thing was my own father, uh, who I never thought I got enough love from or enough communication from or enough. He was such a quiet man. Mm -hmm. And. I came up with an idea to, 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 to do something with him. Mm -hmm. I bought an old abandoned farm in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and Dad had seen a solar envelope house uh, in Popular Science magazine on the cover. He liked it a lot. I said, Dad, let's buy the plans and let's build that house. Oh, wow. So for nine months, we worked on this house, hired a contractor, and all of us worked on this together, wow. and we worked and worked and worked, and every night we slept in a little 
cabin that we had made. And Those are powerful. directly out of that S training, I bonded with both my son and my father in such a way that I hadn't been able to figure out before. So if nothing else, I give it credit for that. That's massive, massive development in one's life to reconnect with father and son. It was. And not just reconnect, but to take it higher. Right. So <clears throat> I would say yes to all things that came my way in terms of self-improvement, trainings, uh, workshops, wilderness workshops. Um, well, let me ask you this if I can, not to interrupt your flow, but I mean, you, Tom is a longtime yogi, if I'm correct, with Patabi Joy, correct? You I did. In India for nearly a year, I, right? I, I did 12 years of the Shtanga Yoga. One year in India, then I traveled with Patabi Joyce and filmed him and all of his major teachers. May I ask, how has yoga, as you continue, how has yoga influenced your heart? <clears throat> How has yoga influenced my art? <clears throat> well, I don't know exactly how to answer that, but I'll tell you um, how I came to yoga. Uh, I was in Los Angeles, in Venice, deep roots, uh, both business-wise, politically, artistically, uh, culturally, uh, deep, deep roots in Venice. I was in love with Venice. and. Uh, Never thought I'd leave. My girlfriend has some friends visit. I put them up overnight. They start doing Ashtanga yoga in the morning. I said, what is that? <laughs> they tell me, serendipity. They say, there's a man in Santa Barbara who just led a workshop. His name is Patavi Joyce. He's going now to Mysore or to Maui, and he's leading a one-month training. And I just said, yes. And I came over here, and I fell in love with the yoga community. The people were extraordinary. The yoga teachers were great. <clears throat> the old man, Patabi Joyce, was great fun. And um, wow. my life changed at that moment. <clears throat> Much like with the S training, a big shift. Um, I, start, I started swimming in the ocean. I started running up and down the street. I started watching how people you know, in the yoga world would eat, how they take care of themselves. Um, so I learned a lot about lifestyle, about taking care of myself, about um, health, awareness, and I think having those tools in my toolbox definitely helped my art. So you are very disciplined in your diet, disciplined in your body, disciplined in your relationships. You've learned a lot of self-respect. Is that? I have a long way to go, but I did make major shifts. Okay, let me jump around then. You know, Duchamp, a major mentor, correct? Right? Yes. May I ask, for history's sake, for my sake, all of us, rare to meet and have him as a mentor. That started by, uh, I used to have an in, a, uh, assistant intern, if you will, named Rita Johnstone, young woman, looked like Peggy Moffat from the 60s. Uh, dark hair, cute girl. And we worked together in this gallery. And she would send off letters to all different food companies and compliment them on their food. Oh, yeah. uh, just cold. And invariably they would send her packages of food. Oh, wow. And she was poor as a church mice, so she was able oh, to live yeah. on that, just on her letters. So I said, Rita, uh, <laughs> let's send a, a letter. I, I had an idea for a series of shows. <clears throat> uh, found art show, ready-made, uh, children's art, self-portraits, uh, various types of shows. And I said, let's send Marcel Duchamp. But I heard that he was still alive. I thought he was dead. I got, somehow got his address. We sent him a letter inviting him to come to my gallery to uh, send a piece of found art. Well, I get a postcard in the mail. And Duchamp says, um, I'm not making art anymore, but I'm very honored by your letter. Mm. And I'd like to come to your gallery and I'll enter myself in your show <laughs> as a piece of found art. So I thought that was great for him. He says, I'll call you when I get to Minneapolis. He happened to be coming, I didn't know this, but he was coming for a show at the Walker Art Center. He arrives in Minneapolis, I drive my Daimler, I don't know, 1951 
fabulous old English Daimler with suicide doors, drove to the hotel, picked him up with his wife, Teeny, and drove him to my gallery. And uh, we, Marcel and I clicked, and we decided to play a trick on my assistant, Rita. I trained her to say no to people that came up that wanted to have an exhibition, because mm -hmm. we had so many people. Mm -hmm. I just flat out said, if you come in the door asking for a show, we're booked. We don't have time. Oh, wow. So, oh, he, wow. so I, my, I said, Marcel, I'll drop, and I explained this to him. I said, I'll drop you off at the front door. You go up and ask if you can have a show there. So he goes up, and I park the car, and I'm coming up, and Rita's explaining to him that, no, we don't have any room for his art that he can't show there. <laughs> and I said, Rita, meet Marcel Duchamp. And she just started crying. Oh, my God. And hid in a closet for about oh, 10 God. minutes. Anyway, Duchamp was full of puns and lively, and and he saw some erotic collages I was doing, and he loved them. He says, that's the freshest art I've seen in years. Could I have one for myself? Oh, wow. And an I thought, yeah, you sure can. Then he said, could I have one more for my friend Max Ernst? Oh. They remind me of what he did as a young man. So I gave him the collage. And then he signed my necktie, and he made me a ready-made. Oh, so I became a, a ready-made, a piece of found art. And uh, he invited me to come to New York. Unfortunately, I, I didn't. I went west instead of east. I went to the west coast when I closed my gallery. But he, you know, he had a huge effect on me. I figured as much. Um, Duchamp was, uh, was uh, so, I don't know, somehow I connected with what he was doing, the way he looked at the world, the fun that he had, the eroticism, the mischief, the uh, always, uh, um, you know, tipping over the apple cart. Uh, and he, that? he instilled in me something that I still have today. And beautiful, thank you for that. And what would you say then would be the most powerful second influence in your artist? Oh, Basil Langton, for sure. Well, please, if I can invite you for the moment and history's sake to share your thoughts on this. Gentleman. Okay, one day in my gallery, a man walked up the steps. It was the second floor gallery, 818 Hennepin, Minneapolis, across from the State Theater. Uh, this man was a photographer, uh, working at the time for Life magazine in South America. <clears throat> His wife was in the walk in the Guthrie Theater, so he'd come to town to visit her. And he comes up to the gallery and he sees what I'm doing with these collages, with the fun I'm having, and the, uh, the whole environment here. I'm 23 years old and I'm on fire. Oh. And I'm making these collages one after another, and we, cl we click. He says, um, and he starts photographing me, and um, we start corresponding for 35 years oh in the mail, letters, pack, letters back and forth, back and forth, whether I'm in India or France or wherever I am, oh, we're sending letters. If I'm up, I'm down. If I'm down, I'm sending letters. If I'm up, I'm sending letters. If I'm in between, whatever it is, I went through some terrible depressions, breaking up with girlfriends and one thing or another, and financial reversals and whatever it was, I would write to Basil and I'd get these incredible letters back. It was reliable and it was responsive. Absolutely. Oh, I, have a book, I have a book, thick book of our correspondence back and forth oh. and the collages, the effacages, the work that he would send me um, had a huge impact. He turns me on to Ram Dass, to uh, uh, Lao Tzu, to uh, uh, major artists in, in Europe. Uh, turns me on to uh, uh, dancers and musicians and uh, philosophers, people I'd never heard of. I mean, he was an amazing man, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, through Basil, it just enlarged my, my scope of the world because he was a world citizen. What a gift and a magnificent artist who worked on a card table in his bedroom. Oh. No big studio, like all the Venice artists at the time right, all had right. these giant studios and right. you know, they had to have a big studio because they had big egos. It, he worked on a card table and he'd make this amazing art. And he'd have exhibitions and galleries. I would go, I would meet his dealers and his, his collectors and so forth. 35 years of Beautiful communication. What a breathtaking testament to 
a relationship, rare relationship. The book is in the Getty uh, Research Institute, uh, in the books of artists of section, uh, put in there by Weston Neff, who was the uh, head of the Department of Photography. He said that this document was amazing and it reminded him of the correspondence between Duchamp and Man Ray. Oh, wow. So I thought that was a nice well, Let me just encourage those of you who are watching and listening throughout history, long past March of 2022, may it go into the next century and onward, please look into Tom's archives, his exhibitions, his history, his biography. If you could see the wall of magnificent color books in front of us, which we'll show perhaps tomorrow or insert into this video, learn more about his mind and life through his website, tomsewell.com, if I'm correct. Rubach and... Rubach's son built my house, David Vitarelli, with my good friend, Peter Powell. They used as, a, as sort of a guidebook, a book called A Pattern Language, written by Peter, uh, Christopher Alexander from Berkeley. And it talks about what works in architecture oh, wow. through the years, 500 years. Uh, rooms with light coming from both sides, uh, small paint windows versus big bay windows, soft walls, cedar, uh, the idea of non-toxic uh, home, uh, no paint, stains, varnishes, drywall, things like that, insulation. Uh, so his son, David and Peter, built my house. And they, uh, David said, you know, you've, you really need to meet my father. And so one day uh, at the Hui Nui out of the local Visual Arts Center, I see this old man dancing to some marvelous <laughs> music. There's some like Appalachian music playing, and he's doing this marvelous dance. He's an old timer. And I just start dancing with him, and we fall in love. Oh, my God. He was so oh, fun. His name was William Vitarelli. Uh, he was a friend of Michener's. They did puppet shows together back in Bucks County. He was a uh, uh, Quaker, wasn't he? Quaker, an architect, a, a gardener, an artist, many things. So we became very, very close. Also a very important mentor to you. Yeah. And he lived here on the island. He lived nearby. He lived nearby. And so every uh, every Wednesday night we'd go to his house for dinner. He'd always have some interesting guests. Uh, every new moon, full moon, uh, he'd call me and said, what are we going to do for fun today? Because I didn't do my Ashtanga yoga, so we'd go out and have coffee. Oh, wow. And then we'd go to Borders, we'd read books, we'd look at magazines, we'd chase girls, whatever it was. We'd have fun. It's so inspiring, Tom, to hear, and I mean this in the depth of my sincerity, having lost my father, my teacher, and my mentors, male mentors, and three of my male best friends in the last four years. You just obviously can make new friends, but you can't make new friends, old friends. It's very rare to meet someone who has been a pillar in your life. And it's so wonderful to be nurtured right now. I just want you to know that to re-inspire that sense of how important men are to men who you can look up to and learn from. And may that tradition keep living through. Tom is a mentor to me in terms of his lifestyle. His elegance in terms of inclusivity. There's a field of trust that I feel with you and Michelle and the people in your life that I've met through you, where you just feel like you not only belong, but you feel like you're important. And that's just a rare gift to have communicated without it being full frontal. It's just a way of an atmosphere, and so thank you for keeping that tradition active and bequeathing it indirectly to others who you bring in through your grace and generosity. You never know when a mentor will walk, knock on your door. Hand me that book, Eric Small. I'll show you an example. I was living in Venice, California, and I was complaining uh, to my friend Paul Bob, who I shared a house with at the time. I was complaining about my bed back low back pain. So he says, you've got to meet Eric Small. And uh, Eric Small was a, is an amazing yoga teacher. Mm. Started doing yoga in a wheelchair at MS. And he became uh, Iyengar's right-hand man. And he uh, 
was in charge of the Beverly Hills Iyengar Yoga Center for many, many years. Oh, wow, wow. And so Paul Bob said, you've got to, you've got to meet this man and, and see him. And um, I mean, he's just this magnificent man. He's such a fabulous I mean, posture. You, you wouldn't slouch if you were near him. You would stand up straight and you would have your head up and your nose straight out and you'd look at the crowd like off in the distance and you'd breathe deeply and you were a different person when you were near Eric Small. Oh, beautiful. And he was beautiful and he had an elegant home in Beverly Hills and a great yoga studio, wonderful art. And I just fell in love with the man. It was, he was so wonderful. Mm. Changed my life. Oh, wow. And he's the reason I got into yoga originally. Oh, wow. So, the earliest inspiration. Yes. So you never know. I mean, there's mentors all over the place. All you have to do is say yes. You have to recognize the beauty in a person mm -hmm. and um, open the door to, to mentorship, open the door to friendship. Life is full of, uh, full of magic full of surprises. It's an attitude of heartful openness and a, with an aspiration that you can learn through other. Is that coming close yeah. to like the physics yeah. of it? Sure, yeah. you can put those words on it. But it's, it's a lot more than that too. Right. It's things that I can't even describe. But it's just part of my life is to say yes. How, how does someone who is say in their t early 20s listening to this Says, I want a mentor like Tom Sewell has had. How do they go about that journey rather than just an attitude? Well, you can't just dial mentor.iwant. I say, get um, Uber to deliver it. I say, be willing to say yes, be willing to, to uh, work for someone, to assist someone, to somehow call some attention to yourself that the mentor would be attracted to. There, that would there, be yeah. one thing. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Always, helpers are always very good, if you know. Uh, I knocked on the door once of a man uh, when I came back from Brazil. I, w I was uh, in the, in the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and I noticed we'd grown up nearby, and I noticed the place was different. The art looked better, it looked different, it was hung different, it, the walls were different colors, mm -hmm. the walls, some of them were fabric that had been turned around the backside, mm -hmm. showing, and it, it looked 18th century, 17th century. Mm -hmm. And I said to the guard, who's responsible for this? He said, oh, that's Carl Weinhardt, the new director. I said, where's his office? He mm -hmm. said, downstairs, the first on the right. I went down, knocked on the door, Mr. Reinhardt, I'm your new helper. Oh, wow. He says, come in. I said, I've just returned from Brazil, wow. and I've learned a few tricks, uh, and uh, I think I could be of assistance to you. I said, I'll work for you for nothing. Uh, just give me a chance. He said, well, I can't really turn that down. So I worked a couple of weeks, and he put me on the payroll, and I did a lot of projects for him. And it was like, he was my mentor. He became a mentor when I saw what he did. He went on to work for Huntington Hartford in New York at the museum that he had, and uh, I, it was just a super, super, super uh, encouragement to me because I was just learning about art. And the next thing I did, I made a whole scale model of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts so he could set up exhibitions in miniature. My father helped me build it. We made little scale models of all the tapestry, the paintings, everything. Mm -hmm. And so he could set things up in miniature. Mm -hmm. and that was a great experience for me. I dare ask this, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but has there been female mentors in your life? Well, yes, Catherine Dahl, of course, major mentor, both amuse, girlfriend, and mentor. Wow, you brought and, it all together there. <laughs> and she, uh, here she is, she's uh, 83 years old now, living in Atlanta, and uh, as beautiful as ever, mm. and a major collaborator. Uh, heart so big, and she she keeps encouraging me to look higher, to be higher, mm -hmm. to think better, to uh, improve, 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 and to uh, put my best foot forward. And she comes up with great ideas, 
And whenever I'm on a project, I just immediately send it to her and get her feedback. Mm -hmm. And she'll send back these great letters, kind of putting it on a whole different level and encouraging me to talk about this and that. Let me sidetrack a little bit if I can. You just triggered something in me that I think and feel a lot in my own life art and expression through book and film. How would you evaluate the choice-making process in the development of an art piece to know what to do, when to do it, when to extract it, when to edit it out, when to keep it in? What is that intelligence that you have evolved over the decades? How could you talk about that intelligence to take something that's good and make it great? and know that this is enough. It may be rejected, but this is what I wanted to create. Well, my first choice is go to Catherine Dahl and see what she says. So back to mentoring, Absolutely. get their opinion. Back to mentoring, what does she say? And uh, Elizabeth Freeman, another one in, a, in Kauai, dear, dear old friend, ex-girlfriend, wonderful, smart, beautiful woman, great ideas, and, and I just, bounce things off her and I get these response that is takes everything to another level. So what we see in your art through videography and collage and photography and sculpture is a process of interaction with people that you respect. Yeah. Both muse partner and mentors plus. Yeah. And you reciprocate and bring into the art their ideas and leave behind sure. what you don't want. And I've got a, a fabulous staff that I work with here on, on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays James wow. Malenik comes in wow. if I have shot some video or, or done some photography or whatever I give it to James and I tell him kind of what I want I'll come back the next day and he'll take it to the next level and you clearly empower your own voice as the last decision yeah you you take and leave behind what's right and well, when you say my own voice it would be my voice with Many of my so you're a collaborator, mentors. a real true uh, collaborator. Absolutely, yeah. I'm I'm a lucky collaborator. So would it is it too much to say that some of your art should have multiple names on it? Sure, you could say that. Which would, pieces of art? Your sculpture, your books, what your painting, get, it your would get, It would get complicated, but I'll show you an example. Wow. Okay, that's a very interesting insight. I. <clears throat> One sees art and thinks of art often as alone and somewhat singular. Well, uh, I got a call uh, years ago uh, from, uh, might have been Mickey Eskimo. Oh, yeah. One of my dear friends and a fabulous artist. Uh, Mickey said, uh, there's a wedding going on at my at his sugar mill, the old haiku mill, and that uh, they needed a photographer. Money was no object, and they had thought, they might suggest that I photograph the, 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 the wedding. So I did. So I got uh, Michael Gilbert, my dear friend and mentor, mm -hmm. who's my photography guru, mm -hmm. and Olivia. And uh, uh, we went over to the, to the mill and photographed and filmed the wedding. It was uh, happened to be uh, William Hurst's grandson. Oh, wow. And he's a wonderful, kind of a black sheepy kind of guy. And in Hertz, he just passed away, didn't he? Did he? I think a couple of books ago. I didn't know that. Yeah. Anyway, he was marrying a young French girl. And so we went and had this great experience photographing the wedding and taking all these, these marvelous photographs oh that, um, and putting together handmade books, Japanese style. My Lord, what a piece of art of, of the wedding, and uh, we can cut these pictures in later, probably. But it's an example of an example of collaboration. Here's Olivia in her little short dress under a chandelier. Uh, but uh, here's the cover of the book. One of the photographs uh, is Olivia took, and I thought it was one of the best pictures, and somehow. She or one of my interns photoshopped in the color of the butterfly, butterfly <laughs> and it became the cover of, of the book. It's a magnificent and, creation. Uh, it's just an example of working with all these different people. And uh, 
seeing what they how, how they help me come up with various things. That's a, you know, having lived in the country of Myanmar, Burma, where the Buddhist culture there, living as a Buddhist monk, is based upon just an aside to complement what I feel Tom is sharing, this concept of dana or generosity and the willingness to include your life as a relational experience with other, both in giving and in the art of receiving and this collaboration that I can't be who I am without you, this South African concept of Ubuntu. And it's really striking me at the moment that Tom is an expression of the Ubuntification of art. It's not just collaboration, it's like, it's a type of collective synergy to bring something bigger than the individual. Ubuntification. Ubuntification. I like that. Yeah. I'll put that on my card. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's the active energy of Ubuntu, so that we don't stay dogmified by it, you know, and petrified by it. Two other examples. One is uh, a collaboration with a man who is uh, writing a, a, a biography of me for over a 12-year period, uh, Tom Moran, formerly of Rochester, New York, currently lives in Florida, retired uh, teacher, visited me here about 12 years ago mm. with his wife and was really quite influenced, blown away by the experience of being here mm. and seeing what was happening. And he says, could I call you every Sunday? Well, he um, just started out, you know, once a, once a week calling me on Sunday afternoon and recording our conversations and writing about your life. So I said, sure. So we've been doing this for 12 years now. Every afternoon on Sunday afternoon, he calls me and we're considering different titles uh, for my book. Mm -hmm. and this is just one particular suggestion. Uh, lots of luck. <laughs> so it's, a, it's and a conversational memoir. Conversational memoir. He records everything. And, and, oh, wow. Uh, what a, types a it unique and, and creation. He's, he's got a fun way of looking at the world. Uh, he, we also collaborated. And that's ongoing. Yes. We collaborated years ago on a, on a film. I was going through a, a depression, breaking up with a girlfriend. We decided to do a film on Venice, California. Uh, I, I got a hold of Brad Kay, one of my dear friends, who's an incredible savant musician that just has kind of 1930s in his blood. And he did the music. Uh, Doug Trumbull, who just recently died, lent me a camera and showed me how to use it. We filmed the movie. Tom and I did, and made a book and a film called Fantasy by the Sea, which is still oh, wow. available. And Venice was sort of the epicenter of your creative origins? Well... A bit in Minneapolis. Minneapolis and then Venice. But 20, Venice then yeah. became yeah. The, the, the sort of the Tibet, so to speak, of, exactly. your, yeah. of your, your evolution as an artist there. Yes. Now this was the mid-60s, early 60s, Monterey was 67, so you were... Yep. I, mean, you... I went there with Catherine, my girlfriend, and my brother. And you were there in the 60s and the 70s. Yes. And then you came here to Maui in 1990? Yeah. And you've been here on the Sewell Estate Studios since that time? Yes. Wow, okay. And here it is 32 years hence, and you've... When was the Sugar Mill Studio creation inaugurated? Just last year. I've had it for a year. I, but I've been doing Sugar Mill related art for okay, years. Allow me to give a little rave if I can to yeah. Sugar Mill. I have traveled the world, numerous countries, numerous continents for five decades. And I actually have to admit, uh, Tom preceded me, but Venice is the epicenter of my spiritual life where I was living as an artist Young at the time, 25, 24, 26, where I left to ordain in Burma as a Buddhist monk. And so I have a very special place with that. But the sugar mill, coming back to the sugar mill, 
It's a must stop, regardless of whether you're a tourist in Hawaii or Maui. Residents, whomever, tell your friends, come to the sugar mill, and I dare say, have tea with Tom, have him or his people, assistants, or Olivier, or anyone, show you some of the installation, and feel the history of Hawaii, the abandonment of sugar, the evolution of art out of life, and learn more about just, not just Tom, but the representation of living life as an artist in conscious connection to the land. Yoga, philosophy, spirituality, diet, health, ocean. It's a regard, high regard. I'm saying things that are obvious, but so easily neglected for the art piece. Art as life. At this time and day, look at the wars in Ukraine and Burma and Russia. We're at the precipice of a nuclear holocaust. We're missing the feminine-inspired beauty of making life sacred. It means caring. The studio is an epicenter of that. And I don't exaggerate that. I'm an underestimator of what that is. I've only been there a couple of times. But come there and ask questions. May all the five-star, four-star, six-star hotels, wherever you are in the Hawaiian chain, wherever you are in the world, make it a point, tour directors. Book appointments for five, 10, 50 people to come there and trust me, I've traveled the world. It will be a memory that will not be forgotten. And it could be far more important than your trip to Haleakala Crater seven sacred pools, because there's so much there that you will not hear or get by someone who's not just an informed longtime resident of the Hawaiian chains, but has a high regard for the indigenous population, for the life, not just of our planet, but the future of life. And so the sugar mill, TomSewell.com, yes, I'm giving a rave for it, why? I'm a human rights activist and an artist. I care about, I have a daughter. We're all gonna die, we don't know when, as it's been said. But this sugar mill, it'll be hard to destroy the heart and the art and the integrity of this thing. It could be that the entire island gets covered over by lava from one of the great overflows somewhere in the world. But the sugar mill is going to be there with the art of this gentleman and the people who made it. So make it a must stop on your tour. I wow. have to get that off my chest. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. One of the things I like to do at the at the mill is to acknowledge the workers who work there. 140 years of of working the mill. And a lot of the guys are still alive. A lot of the old timers come in and I'll quiz them about different pieces of machinery. I'll photograph them, put their face up on the wall wow. and create a gallery, a, a gallery of workers because uh, I don't want people to forget them. It, to me, these men and women uh, toiled and worked in that mill, uh, some of them their whole lives, some of their families, kids, fathers, uncles, grandfathers. It's wonderful to hear the stories. Wow. And to... Um, so you keep alive the lives of those who walked the earth and lived and worked here before us. I, I do, and it's not only me doing it, but it's Jill Pridemore, at the Sugar Museum doing the same thing. I'm working hand in hand with her and helping them with their exhibits and ideas for uh, cultural events. Yeah, I have to, again, pause. I, I can only be myself. I've tried the other, it didn't work. And Tom, you're, you truly touch something precious because you know we've been in this pandemic, set aside the politics and the pornification of everything. And you keep alive this ancient, simple human quality of caring for the relational integrity of something larger than the individual. And me, as I emerge out of this pandemic, it's a true heart gift to feel, yes, I'm making a right decision. Being here on the property with you and your wife and muses and the birds and the mongies, it's nurtured something in me that I haven't had in the last two, two and a half years, based upon the pandemic, having shows canceled, had a documentary film. We each have had our difficulties. 
And now, regardless, we're coming out. We're living again. And that means living with heart and art and caring. And your life and your message intrinsically communicates not just the courage to do that, but just the indispensable beauty of it is what I want to say. Thank you. I think that's you. what I want to just honor that I'm feeling in your company. Thank you. So shall we continue this little journey? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious about maybe a little bit of a taboo topic only because of my intrinsic monastic guilt, but eroticism. The muse of the tasteful sense of video and photography with eroticism and sexuality and the artistry of that in your own heart. Can you talk to us about well, where the intersection is? There's a, uh, a big division sometimes with the muse uh, between the, uh, the wholesomeness of the experience with the muse and then there's other muses that become more erotic and there's a big gulf there. You don't have to have the eroticism with the muse although I certainly have had it. Uh, case in point is uh, Chloe Mons, one of my major muses in France. Uh, we traveled Europe together, uh, Italy, France, all over, and did amazing photography, amazing work, uh, much of it very erotic. Um, other muses, you know, can be married, and, and it's a completely different story. So you don't have to have the eroticism with the muse, although I have many, many uh, experiences that turned out to be erotic, and I worship that, and I uh, applaud it, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm, it's very stimulating. Um, I have a, an archive full of marvelous uh, shelf after shelf after shelf of, of amazing projects that I've done with muses. So it, it can be uh, different levels. Um, the what, what does it mean to bring art, integrity, and dignity to the erotic interface with photography and film? Well, it's Take, hard. Well, how could you talk about helping to shape someone who's alive to whatever it is your preferences are in bodied form, how to bring more... I think having a, having, you... having a respect for the muse, for the model, is important. Mm. And a certain joyfulness, a certain playfulness. Um, I personally have really no interest in pornography per se. I'm much more interested in beauty. And um, I worship the female form and um, set it very high and want to respect it and appreciate it. So it's... Uh, what are some of the components in your heart of worship? How would we understand that meaning? How do you venerate the female form? Well, the worship? if I'll put together a, a book, for example, um, uh, on a muse. Um, I think that when a person looks at it, they will know immediately where this is coming from. Mm. If it's coming from a sense of excitement and, and respect and, and appreciation, they'll see that. So you have a high discipline for your intention. I think so. I think so. So access to your inner environment, in other words, with high regard for your own pure intention, but also a courage to explore the erotic, right? Your, some of your films that I've seen and some of your photography is, it's not provocative, but it's compelling. Well, give, I'll give it plays you, a very beautiful edge. I'll give you an example. I was driving down the Hana Highway one day and I heard a piece of music on NPR. Gene Schiller's program. 
And he played a piece of music called Spiegel M. Spiegel, uh, Mirror in the Mirror by Alvo Pert. And it was absolutely amazing, the mm-hmm. piece of music. It just mm-hmm. hit me like, like the first time I saw my wife, Michelle. It just hit me. Oh, wow. And I stopped, pulled over, and I just started to cry oh, listening to this goodness. music. Deep. Next thing I did, I picked up my phone. I called the woman that I liked very much, a very large woman named Leslie, who was a former limousine driver, taxi driver in New York City, came to Maui, somehow made some money in the stock market or something, and became this maven, this art collector, this, this fabulous woman. And I'm telling you, Alan, she was uh, heavy set, very heavy set. You might say obese, even, if I may use that word. Mm-hmm. But she had a body that I just loved. It was voluptuous and flowing and moving. And I said, Leslie, <clears throat> meet me at Cam 1 tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. I'm going to film you naked in the ocean. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> wow, wow, wow. She said, of course. <laughs> oh, wow. That's... So I drove over. As I drove over, I picked up a hitchhiker, a young woman, attractive young woman. And I told her what I was doing. And I said, you're welcome to be a part of this if you want. She said, fine, count me in. <clears throat> so we get there. I call Michael Gilbert, my photography guru. He's got a uh, scuba gear, wetsuit and all, and an extra hose. And I put my camera in a plastic bag and we go down underwater. The two women take off their clothes and start moving together in the ocean. Now, Leslie, how can I describe her? She looked like maybe a, a continent, like South America maybe, moving in the water. And her body was just fluctuating and the fat was just moving and she was graceful. Here's a woman that has a hard time with her body normally. Walking was even painful sometimes, Mm -hmm. but in the water she's joyful and she's happy and she's swimming like a fish. Oh my goodness. And so she's swimming and the young girl is swimming around her and back and forth. It was Fabulous. It sounds very liberating for everybody. Fabulous. So here we're talking about something that could be very erotic, but for me there was not a not a hint of sexuality in it. It was just celebrating this woman's fabulous body. Yeah, you brought like, a different that to way nature. Of, yeah. A different way of looking at it. Yeah, so I bring the film home, <clears throat> give it to James. We cut it up, make a f- video out of it. I put the Alvo Parrot music to it, oh, wow. and I decide to uh, project it in a circle rather than a square format. And I enter it in our Maui, the local show at the Schaefer Gallery. It gets in, it gets accepted, and I tell them to project it on the ceiling. Oh, wow. And I put pillows and a rug down oh, wow. so people would come in, lay down, and watch this experience and hear the music. Oh, wow. How beautiful. It was great fun. What an innovative style of art that you so uniquely manifest, putting these different elements together that often don't get introduced to each other. The the way that you can see that is in the book that I'm doing on Art Maui. In my uh, 25 year involvement with Art Maui, it's a juried show, uh, usually at the Schaefer Gallery no longer in existence. The Art Maui is defunct. But every year I enter, and I think I was accepted about 24 times, and I was rejected about 17 times. But it was it was a very stimulating thing to have on Maui, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it always got me going. And each year I would do a different kind of a show, mm-hmm. different kind of an experience. Uh, one year I showed a, a, a window an old-fashioned window, a small pane window, with a video screen behind it. Mm-hmm. And I projected what I see out of my house in France out of the living room window. Wow. wow. And I created a living room with a rug and bookcases, and a W.S. Merwin poem about the east window. And uh, each year a different, something different. So I have that both on my website and in book form, which has always been a lot of fun for me to do art. 
You know, we've been going on, but not nearly entering your life and art and heart. However, for the sake of a viewer, let me go into the last third of this very rare encounter where Tom has bequeathed you and me with this rare opportunity. He's declined numerous encounters like this, interviews, conversations, I've been told. So I feel, as I know you do, honored. You are where you are in your art. You're prolific, to state something in an understated way. If you could only see and feel the multi-dimension expression of what you've created over decades and continue to prolifically create. I won't get into how envious I am of Tom's <laughs> lifestyle, his friends, his wife, his muses, his all of that. Life. It's like I've been re-inspired here at the moment of potential crucifixion and birth. But the question is, is there more? And what does that more feel like at the stage that you feel more? What's next for you on the horizon of your art? What do you want to do? Well, I think that the first thing, Alan, that's going to happen is there'll be an explosion with the uh, sugar mill art. I can see a, a giant sculpture park, uh, bigger than the one I have here, perhaps at the uh, Hui Nui Ao or someplace in a tradition of uh, Storm King in New York, of maybe oh, 20 or 30 of my right. sculptures. I'm hoping a, a grant will come through. Um, Jill Pridemore at the Sugar Museum is helping write a grant. So if we got a good sizable grant, we could do a really interesting uh, sculpture park. And I'd like to do that with the proper lighting, the proper walkways and so forth. Yeah, That's okay. one thing. Uh, I see... Uh, uh, many, many more books coming out of the archive with the help of my interns. Um, I've got probably 20 books on Venice, California and various people there that uh, were important to me. Uh, I think there's a book on the, uh, some of the, the main workshop that I did in California was called The Impact Studio. Mm -hmm. That had a huge impact on my life, huge. And I think that deserves to be brought forth and documented more. Uh, that was a program that uh, if I was going to point to one thing if I'd encourage people to do, it'd be a program like that. Mm. Uh, it started by one day of my attorney, a woman, Sherry Tinybotta, came to have me sign some papers and she looked different. She had more intention, she had dressed different and she was communication was clearer, her eyes were brighter. I said, mm -hmm. Sherry, what have you been doing? Mm -hmm. She said, well, you must know about this. It's called Impact Studio. Mm -hmm. She said it meets three mornings a week at 6 a.m. in Hollywood. Uh -huh. And there's two or 300 of us that meet, and we work on our goals. It's a spin-off of some of Werner Earhart's work. It's run by two women. It started for people in the entertainment business, but now it's open to everybody. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll bring you as a guest. So one day she brings me, she stands up in a clear, beautiful voice, unlike, she's changed, she's changed. She introduces me and I end up joining the group. And the point is you join for three weeks, you set a goal for yourself, it seems like a really strong goal. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the people that join get their goal. Oh wow. And you have a, coach, you've got a partner that you call every day. If you're late, they pay 10 bucks, so you're on time, you learn how to be responsible, you learn how to take responsibility. You've got a team, and Love it. And you get up and talk about it every couple of days where you're at with your project. So this is... Oh, it was magic. I mean, Alan, this is there's out. nothing like that here, there's nothing like that anywhere else that I know of. But it's the idea of working together with the program. I wish that I could, I wish that program were here. I would, I would encourage younger people to do what it. What a beautiful it was, passion there. It was amazing. So I got my friends Diana and Paul to join. I got Basil Langton to come. I got Swami uh, 
uh, the Swami on the beach in Venice who would stand on the park bench and, and harangue and, and say poetry. I brought him as a guest one day. Uh, it was, it was, I did nine months of it. Oh. Nine months to oh, find so you're, you're from Venice, you're getting up like at four or five in the morning. Yeah, and, and I, bring a, down there. I bring a carload of, of guests. Oh. And I love bringing guests. And the whole point of it was to manifest vision? Yes, manifest your goals and to learn how to talk about it. To learn how to ask for something, mm -hmm. to learn how to promise something, right? And it was a uh, oh, wonderful culture. What a beautiful it was exchange! You really, really that. nice. So, two of the people that I invited, Paul and Diana von Wellness, dear, dear friends. And then one day, I'm invited to go to Russia with some people in this group mm -hmm. as citizen diplomats. This is 1985. Gorbachev had just got in power, mm -hmm. and we realized that our governments were not really connecting. They were fighting. Mm -hmm. And we were afraid of the Russians mm -hmm. and they were afraid of us. Mm -hmm. And so this yoga teacher in Seattle, Rama Vernon, started Yoga Journal. She said, we've got to go with 80 people and make a difference. So they put together a group of 80 people. I invited Paul and Diana to join. And um, the next thing you know, we're in, uh, we're in a plane, we're going to Russia. Uh, we go to uh, Valhalla, we all meet in an old temple, and we're kind of told how to, how to get into the country. We're going to train. The Soviets are checking everything. They got guns and dogs, and it was scary. Mm -hmm. And they they uh, bugged our rooms. But we had uh, an amazing time. At that time, nineteen this would be eighty eighty six now, uh, meeting the Soviet people, meeting the Russians, going into the homes, schools, churches. Uh, meeting dissidents, meeting uh, psychics, uh, meeting th uh, theatrical people, uh, meeting politicians, oh, photographers, and um, that came out of Impact Studio. It was one of the things that came out of it. Breathtaking diplomacy and humanitarian care. Yeah. So I encourage young people to do programs like that. Self-improvement programs, you could call it or uh, workshops or whatever, where they can uh, experience a group and a teacher and to grow and to realize that maybe they don't have the answers, but they gotta open up and learn. Magnificent. Okay, two questions. Being a fan of love and romance and eroticism and partnership and Having loved, having rejected, having been rejected, broken, we've all been on that shoreline of not working out and working out wrongly. However, you've been blessed, as I've seen over the decades, with a magnificent partner, yes. Michelle. Yes. And so my question is, how would you feel about sharing some of the virtues of your relationship with Michelle and some of the finer elements of the artistry of love with a magnificent woman. What would you say about that? Are you saying, suggesting sharing my wife? Uh, with <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> sharing the insights of why it's so beautiful for both of you. Well, I think that um, the sharing is involved in just uh, uh, observing and to being with us for a dinner or a trip or whatever. What what makes it work so beautifully for both of you is my question. How do you bring your Tom Sewell artistry to that love? Well, we both have had our share of, of, of involvements with other people. And uh, <laughs> for, for me, this just seems like the magic moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I love her family, her niece and nephew, her parents, her grandmother. Um, luckily, her mother and father live on our property, so we have a chance to swim every Sunday together. You do collaborate on every level. <laughs> have, have dinners all through the pandemic. We've oh, had dinners wow. together, wow. Uh, films together. So um, I don't know if I can answer your question, but... Um, I think just being around that, people pick up the vibe. 
and um, we'll bring in people into our life like uh, the other day a fellow came up the street, walked in and said that he was told that he had to meet me and a friend of his in, on the mainland had recommended that we meet. He was a photographer uh, for the New York Times and, and the uh, National Geographic and Michelle and I sat and talked with him for about three hours. And at the end of the three hours, I said, Andy, you've got to give a talk in my studio because I like to have talks. I like meeting people like you do. I mean, you have an ability to, to meet people and to get them and to appreciate them and to pass that on to other people. I like to do that too. So I have a, a series that I call uh, Unexpected uh, Encounters with Remarkable People. So this man gave a talk in my studio. We had about 20 people. And Michelle and I just loved this guy. We had such a good time with him. He ended up staying with us for about a week and uh, observing how we, how we live. And uh, Well, it's a real, I think he, it's both he, a gift and a piece of art to see a Tom Michelle Sewell dinner, much less, as I expressed the other day at the concert with Mariel and with Giorgio? Yeah, Georgie. Georgie and the pianist. Dan Teffer. I'm like, you're just Deffer. like, holy moly. Yeah. But as, in the people I was with that I brought who came, their comments were obviously in awe of the musicality and the professionality of these people riffing who'd never known each other. Yeah. But more the everything about the ambiance, the theater, the land, you and Michelle together and separately, sitting where you do. Everything was <laughs> orchestrated, but with an elegance that wasn't kind of overt. And the art is more than just what's on stage. And I think that is what, to me, is beautifully unique about being near you and Michelle and your fan and your muses. So that's a huge gift. And my final question, I'm one of many that I have, and I really love the art of conversation and interviewing. Um, you know, being a dad, a single dad, a daughter who just turned 15, who does also play the cello and the guitar and keyboard and sings and draws, but also being locked down by masks and mandates and social disambiguation and isolation, and her among many of her friends, and just having a love for children. I just finished a children's book, which you graciously endorsed. Um, tonight I met a Deva, an angel of love. And I really wanted to give something back to the children. And so my question, Tom, is children will likely watch this with whomever their friends and parents and relatives are whether she or he is 6 or 10 or 12, or even the child and someone who's 85 who wants to reacquaint themselves with something. But speaking more specifically to the children, how could you encourage the world of children across countries and languages to follow their heart, their dream, their <clears throat> heart? What would you advise them to think? And feel? Well, I think what it does... <clears throat> It brings up the, the issue of adults and how, how we treat children. Here's our niece and nephew in France, in Prague, and Budapest. We travel every year with our, our sweet young niece and nephew, uh, Michelle's brother's children. I think it's important to, as adults, um, facilitate their uh, their growth in the world of art. We take them to theaters, to concerts, to different countries, um, New York, London, Paris, Istanbul. We take them Budapest. We take them places and, and, and introduce them to different things that they would normally get in Seattle. So I, it seems to me that it's a two-way street I and mean, we've got to have an adult there facilitating for the, the child 
and it gives me tremendous joy to be able to help these two kids mm -hmm. and watch them grow, watch them change, watch them transform. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just um, one of the most emotional things in my life is watching these two children grow and, and evolve. So I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, of an adult and I didn't have that with my children. Mm -hmm. I have three children, uh, all accidental children. I didn't plan them. The first one, I actually married his mom, so that became quite official. I was 18 years old. The second child, uh, her mom was a visitor in my art gallery, a little Catholic schoolgirl, and we became very close, and uh, she ended up getting pregnant. I didn't know it. Her folks sent her to, to Seattle to have the baby. So for 54 years, I didn't know I had a child with this woman. Uh, the third child is my son, Sasha, who is from uh, California. And that was accidental with a neighbor and we had sex and we were together for three or four months and then we separated. And the next thing I know, she tells me she's pregnant with my son. So it was all accidents and serendipity and, and just miracles, like due to 23 of me, uh, gene testing that I discovered the other two children. So I never had a chance to really raise a child. Right. I, I never had a chance to help them learn how to ride a bicycle or to be with them when they're sick or to, mm. you know, all the things that parents do. I mean, I still remember my father holding my head when I was four years old vomiting in a toilet and he's just holding my head. I can feel his hand on my mm. head. I never had that with my, <clears throat> my kids. Mm. So I'd like to try to make up for some of that, I think. But children are the key to happiness for me. Children, mm. music, animals. There's a lot of, of keys that open doors. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you from my heart to yours, Tom, for sharing a bit of your life, your views, your philosophies, your art. And on a final note, um, again, TomSewell.com, portal into a lifetime of conscious art and growth and struggle. And uh, come and visit the mill, come and visit Tom and Michelle, and uh, may this video travel multiple languages and countries to inspire a life of conscious art. You know more important now than ever. So from my heart to yours, and thank you, Tom, for your good life and your time. Thank you, Alan. Honor. Great.